Another day, another boatload of chaos. Welcome back to Moose and Loose. My name's David. Today, we've got another housing accelerator where Justin Trudeau finally says the words that we thought he would never say. We've also got an update to the carbon tax protests across Canada. It's really heating up in Alberta right now where there's tons and tons. There's almost as many police officers as there are protesters. So first up, we got a clip here from Daisy Media that says, uh, tell me we aren't living in a police state. This is Alberta, Canada. Heavily armed police in riot gear with their name badges removed. Line up against peaceful Canadians protesting the national carbon tax. Not a single one of these officers will speak to the people they're lining up against. This is unbelievable. Holy, there's more. <laughs> What's with this? know what they're trying to prove. Oh, did they switch out? Every half hour or so. Oh, really? Or hour or whatever, yeah. So any one of them never came talk to us? Nope. They don't talk to us? Hi. Would you come talk to us? No? Because it's not something we got. God bless you. Would you come pay, talk to us? Nobody wants to talk to us, so we just want to know what you guys are... What you're planning on doing? No, no talking to me, us. God bless you. Did you want to come talk to us? No. So she goes one by one and says this over and over and over. It's crazy that our tax dollars are going to this. Maybe we should all stop paying taxes and see how they think about that. They should have some respect for the taxpayers for once, not this nonsense. That's what our tax dollars are paid for. So do you want to come talk That's to us? That's why our taxes keep going up and up and up and up. Can I get to your you name? Want a and I want These guys are all lined up with like big boom boom sticks. Names are removed. Hungry, with nothing to eat, nowhere to live. That's okay. But if the, what those homeless people should all go and do is all go order up a sex team. <laughs> Then come talk to us. There's a spicy lady back there. Nobody knows what's going on. Go get all the homeless people. Because you know what well, happened? We know to what's going on. When we went into Ottawa, they all disappeared. No? No. There wasn't a rape. Do you speak there English? There wasn't a murder, and there wasn't an opioid death. No. The whole time the truckers were in Ottawa. Do you want to come talk to us? Woo! And what did they do? These guys are disgraceful. Do you want to come talk to us? Once the crime went, went down, nine so what these, um, if any of the protesters out there see this video, what you should do is buy a bottle of wolf urine from Amazon <laughs> and put that in a spray bottle from the dollar store and uh, <laughs> see if you can get some of them to talk to you after you spray a few, a few uh, puffs of that. You'd probably get arrested, so don't do that, but that would be funny because that stuff reeks. It's disgraceful to, to not even say like, hey, we're here to, it's, you have to say something. You don't have your jobs as police officers without us. And we get it. You guys protect us, but you can't be using that protection against us. That's not how this works. Next up, we got a tweet here from Danielle Smith. The carbon tax is a shell game used to tax and transfer money to areas where the prime minister needs more votes. It does not help the environment or reduce emissions. Well said, Daniel Smith. Carbon pricing in Canada on April 1st, 2024, dollars per ton. $80 everywhere except Quebec, 57 bucks. Why does Quebec get, we all know they have their own rules, but that why do they get a lower rate? Justin Trudeau is such a hypocrite. He only lets provinces have their own carbon tax if it's at his minimum level, which is what this is, $80 per ton, except Quebec. I have a feeling in a year here, we might not even make it to the election before you start having like Alberta breaking off. There's a been, I've been seeing a lot of videos and a lot of talk about Newfoundland breaking off since they only joined Canada in like what, just after World War II, 1952. Uh, they're the last to join. Uh, there's a lot of talk about them wanting to break off or potentially them breaking off Northwest Territories and, and Alberta forming a new new country or whatever. Like, guys, you got to be careful what you're doing to Canadians here. People are starting to snap. There's going to be civil unrest in this country, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it once people start going nuclear. So today there was a housing accelerator uh, announcement. I'm surprised Trudeau didn't go hide in his Tofino uh, vacation home. I was kind of hoping he would because I would actually go out and track him down. It's only an hour from where I live here. But instead, we got these two boneheads. Uh, Sean Frazier, once the uh, immigration minister, once he was a absolutely failed and fired from that job, absolutely de decimating our immigration in Canada, then he was moved over to housing so he could further destroy Canada in that aspect. 
Uh, good thing Gumby's on the scene here. And uh, this is in, uh, I think, Nova Scotia. And then you've got the Captain Schmuck back here. So I'm not going to play too much of this 39-minute video, but a couple key moments where Justin Trudeau finally says it. He finally admits to the housing crisis and why it's happening. Spoiler alert, he doesn't take responsibility. As the Prime Minister just announced, we're going to be investing an additional $400 million uh, to through the Housing Accelerator Fund to help some... I should note here, all that drumming in the background, I want to say hats off, big thumbs up to the First Nations. They showed up there to stick it to Trudeau and they chant and drum the entire 40 minute uh, announcement and they just heckling them, him the entire time. Some of those cities who had strong applications uh, but fell just below the cutoff as we were assessing the most ambitious cities. Over the course of the next three years, we anticipate this will lead to more than 17,000 new homes. And if we maintain <laughs> the same level of the success that we've enjoyed in the first round, this could total up to an additional 75,000 over the next decade. So what Sean Fraser just said there uh, is going to total 17,000 homes and at the same rate, what did he say, 54,000? homes over a decade. If you're new here or if you've been here a while, let's do some quick math. Currently at a deficit of 5 million houses here in Canada. 5 million, we'll put that up on the screen. And over the next decade at half a million immigrants being brought in per year, granted if Trudeau was still in power for a decade with these same numbers based on their plans as they would like to see it, that would be another 5 million more immigrants being brought in over a decade, make, making us at a deficit of 10 million houses. And this guy is sitting here bragging that they can have potential of building 54,000 homes. Like, get out of our country, man. <laughs> I don't know why he would even say that and think that's something that's impressive. It's disgraceful. But we know it's not enough just to incentivize oh, really, buddy? permitting reforms. We need to help <laughs> with the cost of preparing neighborhoods to actually accommodate the additional homes that can be built. What you're about to see here is a fantastic question where Justin Trudeau is pushed on the carbon tax and the, the way of pricing pollution. Trudeau goes on about how any province is able to put in their own price of pollution, etc. We won't, I won't play the clip because we don't need to hear him talk any more than we need to here. But he says that they're, they're welcome to put in their own plan as long as it meets his criteria his his limit and the reporter here asks a follow-up and really pushes him on uh, a question of well what if they have a different way of doing it that's as effective or better and just listen to this has been uh, welcome for years now to put forward a plan that meets the federal targets. Uh, the, the argument in some quarters is the whole point is to reduce emissions. If provinces ha can find a way of doing that without a carbon tax, why, why not? The Supreme Court weighed in on that just last year and said that the federal government has the right and the responsibility even uh, to fight against climate change on a national level. Uh, with the Supreme Court judgment, it is clear that there needs to be a price on pollution right across the country. Any jurisdiction can develop a sufficiently stringent, stringent and rigorous plan uh, that meets the federal benchmark, and we will gladly let them do it. But for now, the federal plan that puts more money in the pockets of Canadians and fights climate change extremely efficiently um, is what's going to be in place. Next question. <laughs> you hear that? He just admitted that fighting climate change is not the goal. The carbon tax, taking our money is the goal. He just admitted that because if, if the whole goal was to fight climate change, he would say, no problem. If they come up with a plan that doesn't involve a carbon tax, but is as effective or more effective, go for it. Like that 100%, if that was someone's goal to fight climate change, how can that not be a solution? He just admitted that Fighting climate change is not his plan. It's to take our money. And he wants our money. He wants to put in his little piggy banks in Ukraine and Davos or wherever else. That's my opinion. But either way, he just admitted that he has the, the uh, legal right to put a carbon tax on us. And that's what he wants to do. And has nothing to do with climate change. This lying snake. The next clip we've got here is where Justin Trudeau admits to the housing situation with immigration and what caused it. But he's still... <laughs> He's Justin Trudeau. He places blame not on himself. No, no, he would never take responsibility. And before I play this clip, I just want to point out some body language because I'm not going to do it while it's going, but he will touch his hair and then he rubs his nose like this. And this is a sign, he, and you can see he tilts his head too. He's very uncomfortable with this question. He does not want to be asked this question for obvious reasons. I'm with Global News. 
You recently said your government is working on both housing supply and demand by turning the dial down on temporary immigration. Does that mean your government's immigration policy has contributed to record high housing unaffordability? Um, there, there, it's really important to understand the context around immigration. Every year we bring in uh, about 450, now close to 500,000 permanent residents a year. And that is uh, part of the necessary growth of Canada. It benefits our, our, uh, our citizens, our communities. Nope. It benefits our economy. Nope. That, these are the levels that we have stabilized and, and grown steadily over the past years because that's what Canada needs to continue to have a strong economy and strong communities. However, over the past few years, we've seen a massive spike in temporary immigration, whether it's temporary foreign workers uh, or uh, whether it's international students in particular that have uh, grown at a rate far beyond uh, what uh, Canada has uh, been able to absorb. Uh, to give an example, in 2017, Two percent of Canada's population was made up by, of temporary immigrants. Now we're at seven and a half percent of our population comprised of temporary immigrants. That's something uh, that we need to get back under control, both for the benefits of uh, of those people, but because uh, international students we're seeing uh, increasingly vulnerable to mental health challenges, to not being able to uh, uh, to thrive and get the education they want, but also uh, increasingly more and more more businesses uh, relying on temporary foreign workers in a way that's driving down wages in some sectors. So we want to get those numbers down. It's a responsible approach to immigration that continues on our permanent residents as we have, but holds, uh, holds the line uh, a little more on the temporary immigration that has caused so much pressure in our communities. So there you have it. Justin Trudeau blames the uh, foreign students and foreign workers, mostly the students, for the uh, the numbers there. And what's ironic about this, if we look, uh, here we go. If you look, who's next to him? This is the man who's <laughs> directly responsible for the immigration and now the housing. All the problems are, are these two guys right here. This is what's wrong in Canada. Now, sure, you can throw in all the other ones, Christy Freeland, Wilkinson, you know, all, all of them, Balsana, whoever. These are the two worst people in Canada. And I can't, I still can't believe Justin Trudeau just admitted he doesn't care about climate change. You would accept any policy that gets to the goal. It's like if a race car driver had someone come in and say, hey, I know a way to make your car go faster. That's legal. That's not cheating. And they, no, no, I don't care. It's <laughs> like, no, of course they would say yes to that. It's just like if someone came up to Usain Bolt's trainer and said, hey, I know a way to make you run faster. It's like they would not care as long as it's legal. It's not taking steroids. Of course they would listen to that. This is the same thing. If his goal was truly climate change and, and saving the planet and all that, he would not care what me what measure it is. This man does not care about climate change, and he admitted it. Next up, we've got a clip here from uh, Sean Frazier. This was a grueling one, I'm going to tell you straight up. This is 31 minutes of listening to this schmuck. But there's one important clip in here that I want you guys to listen to. Thank you for that answer and a follow-up. Uh, today, you heard the Prime Minister say that immigration to Canada has grown at a rate far beyond what Canada has been able to absorb. Much of that growth came while you were immigration minister. Uh, do you regret not putting restrictions on international students or temporary foreign workers while you were in your previous role? Uh, first, and it's clear, Jillian, you have an understanding of this, but for the benefit of those who may be listening, uh, it's important that we distinguish between permanent residency and temporary residency. Uh, of course, as we increased the uh, permanent immigration uh, levels, uh, that a lot of factors go into those considerations, uh, including the capacity of communities to uh, uh, seek both the benefits of a growing population and manage population growth in a sustained and planned way. And I'm very comfortable with the track that we're on as a federal government when it comes to permanent residency. When it comes to temporary residency, there's not a similar annual exercise where the federal government sets a particular level. Uh, instead, historically, what has happened is employers based on demand and, and the need to prove that they cannot find a Canadian to fill a particular role, uh, will be able to recruit through the temporary foreign worker program, workers to fill those roles. Uh, when it comes to international students, uh, what we've seen in recent years was uh, significant growth uh, led by institutions who, again, are using a demand-driven program uh, without regard to the need to house those students. Well, I was still in that portfolio, and you'll, you'll hear uh, answers to interview questions I gave back in the spring of last year. Uh, we were moving towards uh, some of the measures that Minister Miller has put in place, and I think 
think those measures have largely been the right thing to do uh, to insist that a demand-driven program, uh, when it puts too much pressure on communities and doesn't provide the housing or other services people need, uh, then we did need to step in. This is just unreal. So that reporter basically called them out and said, hey, you screwed up the whole thing. And what is his response? His, his response is, oh, well, the, the immigration level is basically saying half a million immigrants per year is fine. He's either, he, what do you say, he's comfortable with that rate? And then he said, oh, well, we, we, we started putting in those measures that Mark Miller took over. So that was really me. Like, <laughs> this guy is just like Trudeau. He, there's no accountability. This guy can't take responsibility for anything. He can't take responsibility for being an absolute loser and failing the taxpayers. But as we come out of this uh, pandemic era and post-pandemic phase, more to what uh, we feel is a normal and uh, stable course uh, for the next few years ahead, uh, I think we have to make sure that we're, even on the temporary programs, which are historically driven by employers and institutions, we put measures in place to ensure that communities can accommodate a growing population. Uh, so to sum up, uh, we made decisions at the time that uh, were important to take, uh, but we now have to put measures in place to allow communities to manage the population growth that we're seeing at the same time they maximize the benefits of immigration. This guy's just a word salad. Nothing comes out. It's just like, I'd rather watch a dog barf than <laughs> listen to this guy. If you're good at your job, Sean Fraser, you would have stepped in when you saw the numbers starting to go cuckoo clocks. You wouldn't just wait until everyone's living on the street before you start doing something you should have had those temporary foreign worker and foreign student uh you know situation dealt with you should have had numbers in place and and regulations and limits to that instead of just willy-nilly letting people create these phony baloney schools where they're charging the average tuition of like ex excess of four thousand percent per student just to, as a way for people to pay to get into canada it's an absolute joke Tell me what you really think, David. <laughs> I, I hate this guy. I'll just say I hate this guy. I hate Trudeau too, but I hate this guy because he's such a failure and he's, he's has such an important job in this country. And finally, we've got one more update clip here of the protest going in Alberta. You can see the co cops all lined up here. This one's got a bunch of different clips kind of throughout all of it. You can see here RCMP deploys 100 plus officers in riot gear, some with, I'm not going to say that, automatic boomsticks. Uh, near a gas station outside of Calgary. We got so much rampant crime, they wouldn't even do anything about it. They'll just stand there arm to arm against civilians who are just exercising their God-given right to actually protest the taxes, the carbon tax, the cost of living. We've had it decried one of the protesters. Here at this level, this could elicit an even bigger response like what we saw at Milk River. Is that what they want? But I think they all need to call in sick, take COVID tests and, and shut her down and say, I can't make it into work today. Did you used to have faith in police? Um, not really, but now it's really bad because they have tarnished the, the badge. Like it's, it's, I have no respect for them anymore. They should have stood down in Ottawa, but they didn't. So right now what they're doing, they're working for their corporation instead of taking care of we the people. So they're not taking care of us. They're ready to pounce on us anytime. And that's very sad. They have hundreds of officers and some of them have automatic weapons. And, uh, what are they going to do? You know, they've, got, they've got too many people down here that just elicits a negative response and, and it turns people against them. And then they wonder why. We saw what happened in Ottawa. We see what happened here. And we saw what happened in Kansas. We saw what happened in Milk River. It's atrocious that this much money is being spent on this when we've got as much rampant crime in these communities and they won't do anything about it. But they'll, they'll stand arm in arm against civilians who are just exercising their God-given rights to actually protest the taxes, the carbon taxes, yeah. the cost of living, and we've had it. The protest started yesterday and it's still going on on the second day. When is it going to end? Well, I've, I've packed for three weeks. Uh, there is a, a few of us who have packed enough food for three weeks. Uh, there are some really nice people in the town close by in Cochrane that have volunteered to come and do our laundry for us. So we would like to stay here for as long as it takes to end the carbon tax. Seems like the, the government is expecting this to evolve into Milk River, hence the huge police presence. But let me ask you this, is it time to kick RCMP out of Alberta? RCMP have no place in this province any longer. And that's what needs to happen here is the Alberta government needs to do a patch over and take the good RCMP officers that want to leave this force and become the provincial police force. And we'll leave the rest of these brethren behind. We'll call it a day and Alberta will, will set the, the, the trail for how we're going to do policing in our own province. And it won't be beholden to Ottawa and the government in Ottawa that pushes these people out here. The problem with the RCMP is their highest level of uh, command comes from Justin Trudeau, thus he controls them. So unless we have a new police force or 
remake the RCMP and have it have higher the highest level of power where you can't say no to them when they come knocking on your door to look for some documents for the SNC Lavalin uh, scandal for example uh, that's what we need maybe it was a military police force is it just a new name space force whatever we want to call it uh but it can't be the current rcmp them standing out there like a bunch of ridiculous losers is disgraceful it is disgraceful and there was actually at the beginning of that clip there if we jump back and you can tell some of them are kind of ashamed but they're you can see here like this face here is not one of confidence there's something going on there and same with this guy. You can tell some of them, even that in the very first clip of the be beginning of the episode, the one guy gave the little head nod like left and right. Some of these guys don't want to be here, but they get direct orders from their superiors. Either way, somebody at the police station here where needs to be fired. Obviously, these commands are coming from up top, right? The Trudeau says, get all your cops out there and make look tough. This is not going to end well. Let me know in the comments down below what you guys think about all this going on and what of uh, Justin Trudeau admitting he doesn't actually care about climate change. I'm going to be clipping that and using that over and over because that's a smoking gun. If he cared, he would say, by all means, do whatever you can. Let's, let's, let's fight this, this fight. He does not care. He just wants our money and he, he admitted to it and he can't take that back now. Oops. The Freudian slips out, Justin. Thanks for stopping by and watching today in the video. I greatly appreciate it all. You be sure to subscribe and hit the thumbs up. We got to keep fighting for freedom here. I'll see you guys in the next one.